good morning everybody. Yes, at this point in time we are now less than two months away of the climate negotiations that are to take place in Paris in early December. That is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Negotiations. So I think as, as many of us know, the purpose of these negotiations is to find a new global treaty, to sign a new global treaty on, on climate change mitigation. And the success of these negoti negotiations are to a large extent going to determine the rate of climate change that we may expect during the 21st century. So the official goal of the negotiations is to keep the global temperature increase below 2 degrees Celsius during the 21st century. That is known as the long-term global goal. It's a so-called overarching goal of the negotiations. And that means that even if these negotiations are successful, we are committed to further climate change taking place during the 21st century. If the negotiations are unsuccessful, we may be looking at a three degree up to a five degree increase in the global surface temperature increase during the 21st century. So what will the consequences be of global warming and global climate change for Africa? It is against that background that the CSIR has embarked on a mega initiative on developing what we are calling the first African-based Earth system model. So during the talk, I'll talk a little bit about what a, what a climate, what, a, what an Earth system model is, but essentially it's a, it's a fully coupled global climate model that is used to make projections of, of future climate change. So to give a little bit more background um, on, on this initiative, there you can see the different um, scenarios of growth in greenhouse gas emissions um, that may play themselves out during the 21st century. So at this point in time, we are finding ourselves on this thick black line, which is known as representative concentration pathway 8.5. It's a low mitigation pathway. So currently, we may expect a doubling of greenhouse gas concentrations compared to the natural values by the middle of this century. Um, the, ne the negotiations is about trying to achieve this red line. Um, that is the only scenario of all of those that are shown on the slide that will safely keep us below the two degree um, threshold. Okay. Many climate change scientists are skeptical if this is still possible. So many are of the opinion that this green line, which is known as RCP 4.5, is a more realistic aim that we may still be able to achieve. And yeah, in the table at the bottom, you can see different um, global projected temperature increases as a function of each of those emission scenarios. As climate modelers, though, it's not necessarily our job to decide which of these scenarios are the most realistic. So we project future climates for each of these different scenarios. And then policymakers can compare a future low mitigation world to a future high mitigation world and decide about the benefits and, uh, and, and the costs that each of these scenarios imply. Now, this slide is a very important part of the, of the reason why CSIR and its partners have embarked on the development of an African-based Earth system model. It shows temperature trends recorded over Africa over the last 50 years. The unit there on the right-hand side is degrees Celsius per century. So that, is, that slide shows, shows the rate at which temperatures are currently changing. And those yellowish shades over South Africa, they are in the order of 2 degrees Celsius per century. And further to the north over Botswana, temperatures are increasing at a rate of more than 3 degrees Celsius per century. And that's also the case over much of subtropical North Africa. Now to put this into perspective, during this same period of time, the global temperature has been increasing at a rate of about one degree Celsius per century. So due to our unique climatological setup in Africa, and especially here in the subtropics, our temperatures are rising at in the order of twice the global rate of temperature increase, even higher over some regions. So a long -term, achieving a long-term global goal of 2 degrees Celsius globally is, of course, not going to mean 2 degrees for Africa. 
So we have an exceptionally strong climate change signal, and therefore it's important for us to have available the most reliable projections of future climate change. Secondly, um, adapt adaptive capacity here in Africa is quite low, as Professor Vogel has already indicated. So um, in order for us to maximize our ad adaptation strategies and to negotiate for support from the Adaptation Fund, the International Adaptation Fund for Future Adaptation Initiatives in Africa, once again, we need the most reliable guidance possible of our climate futures in Africa. And another very important reason why we have embarked on this model development process is, of course, in, cl in climate science. There are certain things about climate change that we are quite sure about. For example, the strong temperature signal in Africa. There are other, also other things that we are less sure about. And many scientists are arguing that in, in terms of future climate change, it is the uncertainty the things that we do not know so much about that we, sh that we should be most concerned about. Now, one example of this is the climate, or the climate processes and the biochemistry and the carbon cycle of the Southern Ocean. So there on the left-hand side, you can see a slide. Those blue, sh th those blue sheets are indicating regions where the Southern Ocean functions to be a sink of carbon dioxide. And it's a source around the Antarctic region um, indicated by the red shades. Now, if global climate change and global changes in temperature should change the ability of the Southern Ocean to function of, as a sink of carbon dioxide, it will have a drastic impact on the rate of carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere. So understanding the Southern Ocean as a sink of carbon dioxide is of fundamental importance. And what CSIR research is indicating that current climate models indicated here on this slide by these bluish shades, and this is the simula simulation of the carbon flux, the seasonal cycle of the carbon flux over the, over the Southern Ocean. The main message from this slide is that the simulated seasonal cycle in the carbon flux is completely out of phase with the observed flux. This tells us that there are fundamental processes in Southern Ocean biochemistry and the carbon cycle that we do not understand. And we need a focused effort to better understand this and a number of other key aspects of Southern Hemisphere climate dynamics. So against that background, we have um, commenced a couple of years ago to build what we are calling an African-based Earth system model. So the points on that slide are, are very relevant to this, to this decision-making process that we've gone through. The second point there is perhaps um, the most relevant. If we look at assessment report four and at assessment report five of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, there were no contributions from African countries in terms of global projections of future climate change. And that was the same in the case of um, other developing countries, such as the South American countries and also India. Now, we are trying to change this. At the moment, there are about 30 of these Earth system models or global climate change models. Um, only one of those have originated in the Southern Hemisphere. So it is time for the development of a global climate change model that is being developed through an African lens and that will focus on African climate processes and the climate processes of the Southern Ocean and the Southern Hemisphere. So our key objectives is to build this new model that will consolidate all the domain expertise that exists at the CSIR and across South Africa in terms of African Earth system processes. We are thinking here about the processes that are taking place in the African savanna, of all the interactions between trees and grasses, the occurrence of convective rainfall and thunderstorms that have unique properties of Africa, and of course the Southern Ocean biochemistry driven processes. And the immediate objective is to use this model 
to contribute projections of future climate change to assessment report six of the IPCC. And in order to achieve that objective, we need to have this model ready in its final form by the end of 2060. And then there's about a very e computationally expensive model integration process that will follow um, in 2017 and 18. So climate change modeling is, of course, very much uh, part of the business of supercomputing. So a key partner in the development of the new Earth system model is the Center for High Performance Computing in South Africa. So the grid system that we are using in the development of this new model is quite unique. You can see it's not a typical latitude-longitude grid. We call it a Q-based grid. And all the key components of our Earth system model are cast on this grid. So from our sister organization, the CSIRO in Australia, we've obtained their Q-based atmospheric model. We have partners at a Japanese agency for marine earth science and technology that have provided us with their Q-based ocean model. And we have, over the last two years, obtained a coupled version of these two models. Then we also have a land surface model on a Q-based grid that is also coupled to the atmospheric model. And finally, we have a biochemistry model from the, from the University of Paris that is, that, is, that, we, that is currently being coupled to the ocean model. So these are the key model components that make up the Earth system model. Now the quasi-uniform grid that you can see there offers some unique computational advantages. And it gives us the ability to, on a supercomputer that is sufficiently large, integrate this model at very high spatial resolutions. And our long-term goal is to perform an integrations at a resolution of about 10 kilometers in the horizontal globally, where we can resolve the sub mesoscale processes of the Southern Ocean and we, where we can to some extent also resolve clouds. So I think that is the, the technical background of this uh, model development initiative and an introduction to all the key model components. Now, against that framework, we have identified five main areas in which we are focusing our model development process. The first is the simulation of atmospheric convection. So on the slide that you can see there, you can see one kilometer resolution simulations of thunderstorms developing in the Kruger National Park area as simulated by our coupled atmosphere land modeling system. And these simulations are performed at a resolution of about one kilometers and in the horizontal. And we can achieve these simulations over areas as large as 200 by 200 kilometers. That's what our compu computer allows us to do at this point in time. So this is a modern approach to improve the simulations of convection that are happening in the Earth system. At these resolutions, we can resolve the clouds. That means we can resolve the dynamics and we can start to better understand the updrafts and the downdrafts in the storms and how these storm movements interact with the storm microphysics. And based on that improved understanding, we then return to the Earth system model and improve the parameterizations. That is the statistical treatment of storms that cannot be resolved in an Earth system model that is typically integrated at a resolution of, at best, 50 kilometers in the horizontal. The second key area of development is improving the parameterization or the description of land surface processes in the Earth system model. So there has never been a focused attempt to describe what we call the plant functional types of Africa numerically within climate models. Now, the African savanna with its trees and its grasses and the huge influence of fire that are reshaping the landscape all the time is a key aspect of African vegetation dynamics. And we gradually need to use our domain expertise in ecosystem dynamics that is very well established at CSIR and in South Africa to improve the description of these plant-related and land surface-related processes in the Earth system model. Now, the CSIR infrastructure of flux towers that are located across the country 
and also additional flux towers from, from which we have access to the data from our partners across the country is a key aspect in this model development process. So um, similar to the case of the convection studies, we are doing model verification studies at very high resolution where we try to simulate the heat and the latent heat and uh, sensible heat and uh, water-related flux fluxes from evapotranspiration at a number of these flux-related sites using the coupled land atmosphere model. And we are then verifying the observed fluxes against the model-related fluxes. And we are finding big differences, simply because the processes around the metal conductance and other aspects of African plant physiology are not sufficiently represented in the current um, state-of-the-art, globally produced plant functional, plant functional type dynamics and physics parameterizations. The third, the third area of um, development is perhaps the newest, and there was a very big meeting about this the last two days in Namibia. It is about parameterizing the aerosols um, of the African continent. So Southern Africa is the largest source of biomass burning aerosols globally. These aerosols find their way into the atmosphere where they have a direct and an indirect effect on climate. They, 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 they interact directly with solar radiation, effectively having a cooling effect on the planet. But they also have interactions with clouds that we call the indirect effect. Um, African aerosol species and types have never been formally parameterized in Earth system models. So by collaborating with international partners that are to launch very big field campaigns in measuring aerosol species and concentrations over Africa, we want to take that observational knowledge and build it into the Earth system model. And another key area of of our focus in the development process, as I've already mentioned, is of course Southern Ocean biochemistry and the carbon cycle. So on that slide, you can see how a number of different global circulation models, existing models, are simulating the, these carbon fluxes between the atmosphere and ocean. And if you remember the first slide, you can see that many of them are quite different and are not even managing to simulate this basic property of the higher latitudes, latitude parts of the Southern Ocean being largely a carbon sink. So there are fundamental processes in terms of Southern Ocean physics, biochemistry, and dynamics that need to be improved in the models. It's a little bit of a technical slide, but this one, effectively, what you can see there on the top left-hand left -hand corner, the, the red line graph, um, shows observations in terms of the seasonal cycle again in the carbon flux. And all the other slides there are from global models. All the other graphs are from global models. Effectively, the red line should never fall into those blue areas. As soon as that happens, it means that the models are not simulating the correct interplay between biochemistry and physical processes communicated through sea surface temperatures on the carbon flux. So this is just another innovative way through which our ocean um, experts and biochemistry experts at CSIR have identified the key sources of error in Southern Ocean climate model simulations. How are we going to improve this? Um, similar to the case of atmospheric convection, our strategy relies on supercomputing. And the strategy is to simulate the state of the Southern Ocean and the Southern Ocean processes at typical Earth system model resolutions of about 200 kilometers up to 50 kilometers in the horizontal. But then also to perform simulations at exceptionally high resolutions, 10 kilometers and 2 kilometers in the horizontal, where we can resolve the important physics of the Southern Ocean, specifically in the form of the mesoscale eddies and sub mesoscale eddies that developed in the Southern Ocean. And once again, through resolving these processes for the first time, we can better understand the underlying dynamics and physics and then go back to the ocean component of the Earth system model and improve the statistical, of the the statistical represent representation of the processes that ought to function at that resolution within the Earth system model. 
So let me conclude by just showing two slides on the outputs that the coupled model is generating. And this first slide shows outputs from the coupled land atmosphere system. These are contributions to the coordinated regional downscaling experiment of the World Climate Research Program. And we will look at an animation. Simulated temperatures from 1971 to the end of the century. That first slide is just an example. The yellowish colors represent areas where 1971 in the model simulation experienced above normal temperatures compared to the period 1971 to 2000, which we call model climatology or climatology. And the, blue, the bluish shades, that's where areas experienced below normal temperatures in that year. So as we move into the climate simulation, you can see many typical aspects of African climate change. So the system is variable. There are warm years, such as the current one, usually El Niño years that are also usually dry. And there are cooler years that are typically La Niña events. But there, already in the 1990s, you can see that the cooler years are occurring less and less frequently. That's because the enhanced greenhouse effect is already working and is warming also the African climate system. As we move closer towards the present day, you can start to have a look at what's going to happen in the subtropics. So in the subtropics, um, we have that strong observed pattern of warming, and that is very realistically simulated by the model. Here we are now into the future. So you'll see how strong warming is starting to establish itself over subtropical North Africa and in the South. And already by the 2040s that we will now move into, you can see that cool years are almost entirely gone. So we never have a cool year anymore. And already in the 2040s, in this low mitigation future, we are starting to see plus 3 degree Celsius years appearing. So what we may call unprecedented changes in temperature are not that far away into the future. Towards the end of the century, for the low mitigation future, the, the bottom animation, you can see how we start to see plus four and eventually plus five degree years appearing. And tropical Africa is cooling somewhat more slowly. And right towards the end of the century, we start to see the occurrence of plus six degrees Celsius years for the case of the low mitigation future. So this is an entirely different climate future, of course, compared to what we are used to. And there will be a range of different impacts. So let me conclude. Uh, this is the second last result slide. Um, of course, this work is not only about understanding the African and the Southern Hemisphere climate system, but it's also about supporting adaptation studies, adaptation strategies, and climate change impact studies. Um, so the projections that uh, the CSIR is generating through the coupled model and its component models are being very widely used. Um, there are numerous sectors in agriculture in the country that are using these projections in making attempts to adapt in time to the changing climate. Our country's energy provider is very much aware of the impacts of extreme weather events on its operations and how that will change in a changing climate. And of course, the water sector and the biodiversity sector, there's a wide range of users of these, of these projections. So to conclude, I think um, due to CSIR being such a multidisciplinary institute, we have the domain expertise. And to, to gradually and systematically build this climate model. So the immediate objective is CMAP6 of the IPCC. So the plan is for the model to be in the final form at the end of 2016. But a long-term objective is to build a model that will be of world-leading skill in simulating Southern Ocean, Southern Hemisphere, and African climate processes. With this comes a huge process of strengthening our capacity in Africa to build climate models and to analyze their results. So we are aiming to, a new, to have a whole new community of climate modelers working and living in South Africa and Africa, contributing to the development of this model. And um, 
I'm very confident that this model will help us to build more reliable projected climate futures for Africa that will help us to formulate our adaptation strategies moving into the 21st century. Thank you very much, Francois.